President Liaquat Hashim of the Ismaili Council, Your Excellencies, my Lords, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Before we commence, a couple of housekeeping points, if I may. We have not planned a fire drill tonight, so if the alarm does sound you, and you require assistance, please make yourself known to one of our uniformed volunteers who will assist you. May I also request for the courtesy of our speakers and the enjoyment of others that you put your phones on silent. Tonight's event is being recorded and webcast live. I am delighted to welcome you to the Smiley Centre for the fourth of our Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series entitled AI Futures, the Societal Impact of Robotics and Artificial Intelligence, commemorating 60 years of the Imamate of His Highness the Aga Khan and his commitment to peace, pluralism and improved quality of life. His Highness has been deeply engaged with the development of countries around, around the world through the work of the Aga Khan Development Network. The spirit of inquiry has been one driving force behind the activities of this Imam as well as his predecessors. As such, the pursuit of knowledge and its application for the betterment of humanity is a defining feature of the work of his institutions. In this vein, this lecture is apt to be part of the Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series. His Highness also refers to intellectual humil humility. So as we embrace the impact of the artificial intelligence, how do we ensure we do it responsibly and with humility so that we improve quality of life and positively impact society? These are areas that we will hopefully explore this evening. I just wanted to take a moment to say a few words about this building where we are hosting tonight's event. The Ismaili Center is reflective of the identity of the Ismaili Muslim community. It is a place for prayer, but also a place for dialogue and learning. As well as lectures, this building regularly hosts exhibitions, recitals, musical concerts, cultural shows, and other such programs that bring people of all communities together so that we may know each other better. Hence why this is the perfect setting for this lecture. At the opening of this building in 1983, His Highness said that this building, quote, represents the inspiring traditions of the past, the stirring challenges of the future, and the continuing search for peace through prayer, unquote. We hope that those amongst the audience for whom this is their first visit will take the opportunity to take a tour of the building after the event. So just to share the order of the evening, we, we are delighted that our keynote speaker is Professor Alan Winfield. He is Professor of Robot Ethics at the University of the West, Engl West of England in Bristol and visiting professor at the University of York. He received his PhD in Digital Communications from the University of Hull in 1984, then co-founded and led APD Communications Limited until taking up appointment at the University of West of England in Bristol in 1992. Alan co-founded the Bristol Robotics Laboratory where his research is focused on the science and engineering of cognitive robotics. After the keynote address, we will have a moderated discussion facilitated by Professor Ulnur Bimani. Ulnur is Professor of Management Accounting at the London School of Economics. He is former head of LSE's Department of Accounting, founding director of LSE Entrepreneurship, and a director of LSE Enterprise. His bestseller books are on financial controls and management, tech entrepreneurship, and aspects of globalization, governance, and economic growth. For the full bio bios, you have a copy of those uh, with you on your seats. But first, to kick off the evening, I would like to welcome President Liakum, Liakat Hashim to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nasreen. What an amazing crowd do we have today. Must be an interesting topic, I guess, for this evening. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman rahim your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Ismaili Center on what is going to be a fascinating discussion on robotics and artificial intelligence. For someone who's a real techie and hasn't missed a single episode of Star Trek, this evening promises to be a real eye-opener. And as the popular saying goes, go boldly, go where no man has been before. This year is a very special year for the Ismaili community as we celebrate 60 years of His Highness's accession to the Ismaili Imamat. 
This is a supranational entity representing the succession of Imams since the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The breadth of achievements over the last 60 years have been both for Ismailis and the communities within whom they live, they've been simply outstanding. We have in the audience today His Excellencies from Uganda and Kyrgyzstan, where the Al Khan Development Network have made major infrastructure developments in hydropower and education, together with the significant universities in Central Asia. With all the excitement around AI, there are some worrying factors. The question of ethics and warfare are yet largely unanswered. Being in the care business, I can see how robots can become a companion to many of our seniors, a number of whom have little or no communication with humans. Is this ethically correct that we as humans have advanced so much that we accept losing that human to human contact? On the other hand, individuals over the age of 65 make up more than a quarter of Japan's population, which has led to Japan's quick adaption of robots and smart sensors in elderly care. This raises ethical concerns for many, but could prove a lifeline for elders left in social isolation. A recent BBC report highlights drones turned into missiles, fake videos manipulating public opinion, and automated hacking are just three of the threats from artificial intelligence in the wrong hands. The malicious use of artificial intelligence report warns that AI is ripe for exploitation by rogue states, criminals, and terrorists. However, do the advantages outweigh the negatives? We already have such high standards of technology in our pockets. Our phones can do so much that none of us here can afford to be techno dinosaurs anymore. In the media every day, we have news of driverless cars, or to use the correct lingo, self-drive cars. This was a science fiction concept not so long ago. You will call a car with your phone, it will show up at your location and drive you to your destination. You will not need to park it, you only pay for the driven distance and you can be productive while driving. Our kids may never need a driver's license and may never own a car either. His Highness has spoken about the creation of Allah. Learn about it, observe it and accept it as a manifestation of God. He reflects on when the first astronauts who were hardened technological people went into space, they came back believing in God. This is a striking example that underwrote the image of Islam which says, learn about Allah's creation. If you look at the breakthroughs we are achieving in science, no one knows what are the limits or how society is going to govern these breakthroughs. There is a need for great humility in the face of science that is demonstrating extraordinary change in everyday life. In one of his recent speeches, he says, quote, our technologies alone will not save us, but neither will they ruin us. It is not the power of our tools, but how we use them that will determine our future, unquote. For us, artificial intelligence is defined as an intelligence such as learning, problem solving and pattern recognition demonstrated by machines such that they work and react like humans. One thing is for sure, we will never be replacing this dedicated group of volunteers known as the Ismaili Center Services with their wonderful hospitality and warm smiles into any form of AI in the near future. <clears throat> Ultimately, we as a society control our own destiny through the choices we make. And on that note, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Professor Alan Winfield, and moderator, Professor Albimani, to enlighten us on this very interesting and controversial topic. Thank you very much indeed.
mean, we did a, a study that we can talk about more later, but if a general public asked, the we asked the question, if you would, you think that a self-driving car should sacrifice the passenger yeah. in order to save a number of lives. The majority of people said, yes, the car should sacrifice the passenger, but I would not buy that car. So it shows very clearly that the market is not the right way to make certain decisions. That's been trained by the world's best oncologists, the 20 best centers in the world. First thing I think we should do our very best work in helping train people for the jobs of the future. Good evening. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to be here in this wonderful building, really wonderful building. And uh, I especially would like to thank, uh, firstly, the uh, Ismaili National Council um, in this Diamond Jubilee year of, of uh, His Highness the Aga Khan. And I'd like to make a couple of personal thanks, if I may, too, uh, to Mohammed, who I think uh, uh, identified me or found me, as it were, um, and suggested me, and to Akbar, who uh, has very kindly and, and graciously uh, helped me to prepare for this, this evening. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, robotics, uh, and AI and the societal implications. The lecture will be in three parts. Uh, firstly, kind of what is a robot and what is AI? And then I'm going to show you some robots from, from my lab and I'm very proud of the fact that I can do an entire lecture uh, without having to show anybody else's robot. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then finally, um, I want to finish off with some, uh, a little description of the work I'm doing in robot ethics. But before I even get into that, I want to tell you a story uh, that um, illustrates the, the problem of, of being a roboticist or a robot ethicist um, these days. So um, it was in 2009 that I had a call from the Sunday Times, uh, and it was a Friday afternoon. It was the science correspondent, well-respected science journalist, and he said to me, he said, Alan, did you know that there's a meeting of the American Association of Artificial Intelligence to discuss robot ethics. I didn't. Uh, so I said, no, I, I didn't know that. He then said to me, am I surprised? Are you surprised that there's a meeting of the AAAI to discuss robot ethics? And I said, of course I'm not surprised. Um, this is simply scientists behaving responsibly, you know, meeting to talk about the ethical implications. This is 2009. So of course I, and we chatted a little, and, and really there wasn't a story. So I didn't expect the headline uh, in the Sunday paper. Scientists fear a revolt of killer robots. Um, so by lunchtime that Sunday, I, you know, I, my phone was ringing, Radio 4, you know, the BBC. Um, and of course, I kept on saying, look, there's no story. But it's, it's, you probably can't read it there. But, uh, but it actually says um, that scientists are secretly discussing robot ethics behind closed doors, none of which was true, of course. So this was an entirely hyped up story, and it just illustrates the problem that, that, uh, that we have. You know, if you're a robot ethicist, then people, you know, they, some people say, well, that's great, but many people say, yes, but there must be a, a, a problem. What's the problem that you're hiding? Well, actually, no, there are, you know, there are no problems that are being hidden. Um, 
otherwise that would be unethical. So, um, so I'm now moving to part one. So if I ask you to think of a robot, um, uh, and uh, you know, I, won't, I won't actually ask you to think of a robot, but if I did, I wonder how many of you would think of one of these. Uh, actually, one of your ambassadors earlier uh, asked me for my favorite, favorite robot, and Wally, -E, in fact, is, is, is right there in the top left. Of course, these are all movie robots. Uh, they're not real. Uh, but one of the problems that, that people like me face is that many people in society think that these robots are real, that, that robots are real robots are like movie robots. Of course, they're not. But actually, what I, what I hope to show you in this lecture is that real robots, real world robots, are much more interesting than, than movie robots. Um, so perhaps you thought, um, no, you thought of, of robots like these, uh, if, you know, if you think of a robot. Of course, these are real world robots, and these are first wave robots. These are the first generation of robots that have actually been around for a very long time. Um, and Yes, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, those are uh, assembly line robots, robots that have actually been around for 50 years or so, um, uh, building cars, washing machines, and so on, uh, on assembly lines. We've also had robots for many years in, in warehouses, factories, um, and surprisingly, um, on the planet Mars. So you may be surprised that I, I regard a Mars rover as a first-generation robot. It's not particularly smart. It's basically remotely controlled from Earth, uh, which is why it's, it takes such a long time to do any science. And of course, we've also had uh, robots um, helping do bomb disposal. These are first generation robots. There are many more, but, but that's just a, a little example. Now, what we're now in is the second wave of, of robotics, and these are much more interesting. Um, so the second wave, you can see immediately, I hope, from that slide, looks very different. Very, very different. The first thing to notice is that second generation robots are designed to work with people up close and personal, not behind a safety cage like the robots in the factory. Um, and this is Rodney Brooks, probably the world's most famous roboticist, with one of his workplace assistant robots called Baxter. And this is a therapeutic robot called uh, Paro. It's a, a Japanese um, a robot baby harp seal. It's very cute, and it's been used with, to great effect uh, to help uh, trauma victims, elderly people, uh, for instance, after the Fukushima um, a nuclear accident. Uh, this is a, a robot that learns, and this is a a robot in the shape of a dragonfly, a, a, an actual flying robot. So you can see immediately that, that the second wave of robots are designed to work with people and to look more like animals or, 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 or even humans, although I'm, I'm not happy about uh, humanoid robots. So what is a robot? Um, well, no, no, hang on, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. So the second wave of robotics, actually, let me, let me go in, in, into a little bit more detail. For those of you that know your evolutionary biology, you may be aware of the Cambri Cambrian uh, period in evolution. This was, it was so-called the, the Cambrian explosion of new life forms, new complexity, new amazing animals that appeared in the Cambrian shale something like 600 million years ago. Now, I believe that robotics is going through that same kind of Cambrian explosion of new forms and materials. So we have uh, robots that are um, uh, copies, copied on nature, multi-robot systems, uh, bio-inspired, biomimetic robots. Uh, the first one, I, I should have said, those are robots designed to work with humans. Um, robots that learn, robots that are adaptable. And perhaps most importantly, and this may surprise you, new materials, new smart um, adaptive materials, synthetic skin, artificial muscles. Um, the problem that with, with the first generation robots is that they, they use electric motors, which are heavy, and it's the wrong kind of motion, very inefficient uh, way of, 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 of getting um, uh, of actuation. So there's a lot of work on what we call soft robots. Future robots need to be light and compliant, just like we are. 
um, so that if one falls, you know, if one falls over and, and falls into you, it won't do any more harm than if a child were to, to, to fall on you. Uh, so uh, really these five um, aspects characterize this second wave of robotics. Now, I promised to uh, tell you what a robot is. Well, my favorite definition is very simple. It's simply an artificial intelligence inside a physical body, or what we call an embodied AI. So it's the AI that gives the robot its smarts. It makes it intelligent. Essentially, of course, a robot needs more than that. It needs to sense its environment. It needs to, to collect sense data from the world. It then needs uh, to decide what to do next. It's what we call action selection. And then it needs to act on the basis of the decision of the artificial intelligence. Um, and that we call this the sense, plan, act, loop. And, and typically, um, that's what a robot does. It senses the environment, it then applies that sense data to some AI, and then decides how to act according to the, that sense data. So, um, let me now show you uh, some of the, the robots. I'm going to illustrate each of those five um, uh, qualities of this second wave of, of robots. So first, uh, biologically inspired robots. In fact, uh, our lab in Bristol, when we started it 25 years ago, we deliberately wanted to do bio-inspired robotics. It was the thing that really excited us. It was brand new. We were the first in the UK to really think about um, uh, bio-inspired robots in, in, a, in a kind of large-scale way. Um, and here are some examples. So this is one of our projects called Whiskerbot. Now, um, you may not know this, but all rats, in fact all rodents, um, actually whisk their whiskers like this. Whereas cats and dogs' whiskers are fixed, um, a rodent will actually feel and, and see in the dark, quite literally, with its whiskers. And so what we've done here, what, what um, our researchers have done, is build a, a, a model, if you like. It's, it's, a, it's about twice the size of a rat. Um, you can see most of it is 3D printed. In fact, all of that yellow stuff, including the whiskers, is 3D printed. So it just shows you the power of 3D printing technology. And that, um, that uh, robot um, senses the world with its whiskers. In fact, it goes even beyond. The biomimicry uh, goes beyond just the whiskers. The robot also has a model in electronics. It's actually about two and a half kilograms of electronics uh, of um, about one cubic millimeter of the rat's brain. So it's the part of the, r the real rat's brain that processes the data from the whiskers, and we've built a model of that uh, in electronics in, in the robot. So in a sense, in a single project, we're doing both um, robotics and neuroscience. We're working with, in fact, the neuroscientists to test models uh, of the rat's brain. Um, and this work has really continued. We, you, know, we, 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 you can see that little uh, picture there of um, the, the current generation artificial whisker module. So that contains all the electronics and the motors to, to cause the, uh, the whisker to, to whisk. Uh, so, um, uh, again, if you're interested, I, I should say, if you're interested in any of these, uh, you'll find details on our web pages of the, uh, of the, of the robots and the projects behind them. Um, Ecobot, uh, this is one of our most famous projects. Uh, this is a project that started some years ago where we, we wanted to discover if we could build a robot that could eat food, could literally get energy from food. Um, and uh, our, first, our first attempt was Ecobot 2, this robot here on the left. And you can see around the circumference of the robot are eight objects. Each of, each of those is called a microbial fuel cell. Now, a microbial fuel cell is basically like a battery with an anode and a cathode, except that it runs not on chemical energy, but on food. And inside the battery, there is a, a, a mix, an inoculum of microorganisms that literally digest food. In fact, any food, any biomatter will be digested. 
And one of the byproducts of that digestion is ions, cations to be precise. And so in the membrane between the, the anode and the cathode, we scavenge those free electrons. And of course, you make a circuit and hey presto, you have electricity. So the wonderful thing about the microbial fuel cell is we're not having to ferment you know, uh, a food and generate biogas and burn it. That's a very complicated process. This is a direct conversion from food to, or slightly indirect, I guess, from food to electricity. And um, the first generation, that, that robot there, EcoBot 2, actually ran famously on eight dead flies. And it turned out that the, 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 the exoskeleton, the, 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 the chitin, which is the, you know, the, the skeleton of the, the fly, is a sugary protein. It's a polysaccharide, in fact. And it's a really good fuel source for the for the, um, uh, the microbial fuel cell. And that robot famously uh, worked continuously for two weeks on a diet of eight dead flies. Now, at the end of that two weeks, um, unfortunately, the robot stopped working. The reason for that was because the waste products of digestion killed the inoculum, killed the microorganisms in the MFCs. Now, that's not surprising. We all know that, that, that waste has to be eliminated. And so um, we built EcoBot 3, this big uh, robot on the right. It's actually about that tall. Um, and instead of having eight MFCs, this one has 48 small fuel cells around the, the circumference of the robot. Uh, and it has um, a little... Um, catcher at the top and we use an artificial pheromone to attract real flies this case in this case real flies not living flies not not dead flies that we find on a on a, 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 a you know a windowsill and those flies are attracted into a, a pond um, the the nutrient rich solution is then piped down to these microbial fuel cells um, and the energy that's uh, generated uh, from the digestion is stored in um, a ring of supercapacitors and every so often the robot will then move um, either to, uh, to, to collect water or basically to move along some rail tracks um, in, the, in the tank in which the robot lives. Now, the thing that, that is really special about this robot is that we believe it's the world's first robot with a complete artificial digestive system. Now, uh, in fact, it also happens to have its own litter tray, because of course you would, wouldn't you? Um, but I want to now show you what's come out of that project, uh, and it's something, it's work that we're particularly proud of in the lab. Uh, we discovered a couple of years ago that um, the microbial fuel cells, which will work on more or less any foodstuff, also work particularly well with urine, with, with human wastewater. And one of the first um, demonstrations of this uh, technology was that we showed that with a single P you can generate enough power to recharge a mobile phone um, to make one call. Um, I have to say it only works on old-fashioned phones like mine, so it wouldn't work with your smartphone. But um, uh, we also discovered that um, if you, if you uh, line these microbial fuel cells up in a stack so that the the waste uh, from the first one uh, feeds the second one, the waste from the second one feeds the third one, and so on. What happens is, 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 is magical. You, you, you not only get power from the stack, but you also get clean water at the bottom of it. So we're, we're cleaning the water uh, and generating electricity at the same time. Now, my colleagues, Yanis Europolis and his uh, group, um, have won uh, funding recently from the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and from Oxfam. And they've been basically building toilets, uh, which you may, think, you may think is a rather odd thing for a robot lab to do, but you know, why not? Um, and here is a picture uh, of prototype toilets that have been used uh, for the last two years running, 2016 and 2017, at Glastonbury as a field trial. And the, the particular focus of the work with Oxfam is to build toilets for refugee camps, where the lighting in the toilet is entirely powered by the wastewater. And we think this is really important, particularly, as you probably know, 
uh, refugee camps are uh, especially dangerous for women at night uh, if they want to go and take a pee. So, so you know, we're really proud of this work. Um, and it's just an amazing demonstration that firstly, robotics, of course, is not just engineering, it's also bio biochemistry, and I also showed you previously some neuroscience. Uh, so it's a very multidisciplinary um, uh, endeavor these days. And you get these extraordinarily interesting and, and uh, I think, very worthwhile spin-outs. That, I think, brings me to uh, swarm robotics, which is, is my own uh, field, or has been, until I, uh, as it were, went to the dark side and became a roboethicist. Um, and a, a swarm of, here's a swarm of robots developed by my um, student, uh, Jan Dierabjörknes, as part of his PhD. Now, the interesting thing about these robots is that they're moving towards the light. You can't see the light because it's infrared. Um, but no single robot can get there on its own. So it's the collective self-organized behavior that not only keeps the robots together as a flock, but also attracts them towards the, the beacon. And we're trying to replicate the kind of self-organization that we see in bird flocking, uh, in fish shoaling, or perhaps more interestingly, in termite mounds, where we know that there's no brain termite. We know that the, the hundreds of thousands of termites uh, each have simple rules uh, of, and behaviors, but collectively they build this extraordinary architecture, cathedral of mud, you know, with, with farms, uh, fungus farms and, and such like. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do in swarm robotics. And uh, here's a more recent project uh, so those of you that, um, uh, the, the young, younger members will know about Terminator, not Term, I'm sorry, not Terminator, what's the movie? Um, Transformers, Transformers, that's right. So what we have here is some robots that can join together. So these are real physical robots in the lab, and you can see that three robots have joined together. They've now transformed into a three-dimensional shape. Uh, they move as a single organism, and then at the end of it, they can return to a two-dimensional shape and uh, disassemble. So you have assembly. And again, this is completely self-organized. So this is not remotely controlled. So these robots autonomously uh, assemble, um, transform to, from a two-dimensional planar to a three-dimensional artificial organism, uh, do some work which might be you know, a search and rescue, climbing over a, an obstacle or, or something like that, uh, and then can disassemble back to individual robots. This was a result of a, a, of a large um, European Union project called uh, uh, Symbrian, which finished a couple of years ago. Probably the most complicated robots that I've ever been involved in building. Um, uh, in fact, overcomplicated. A uh, beautiful example of, of German and Swiss engineering, you can see there. Uh, but probably, I have to say, a little bit over-engineered for the, for, the, for the research purposes that we, we wanted. And my final example of swarm robotics, and I, I couldn't resist uh, including um, uh, my colleague, uh, Sabine, Dr. Sabine Howard here. Uh, she had this wonderful photograph for Wired magazine, uh, and she's working on um, nano particles for cancer treatment. And so, so as part of that work, she's built a swarm of these robots. These are each about, I guess, about a centimeter uh, tall by uh, perhaps half a centimeter in diameter. That, I think, is, a, is a, possibly a, a pound coin or, or maybe a penny. I can't remember. But the, the swarm that we have is a, has a thousand of those robots. They're called kilo. That's kilo for, for a thousand, not, not killer. Kilo bots, <laughs> um, and very important. Um, and she's using those models, as, those robots, as a kind of macroscopic model for the nanoparticles, which are literally only a few microns across, uh, so that she can test uh, in a, a, a kind of human scale the behavior of those nano nanoparticles, which incidentally she's also making uh, in her lab in Bristol um, and, and working towards um, uh, cancer 
uh, treatment. The idea is to try and use cancer, uh, nanoparticles to, if you like, deliver pharmaceuticals directly to particular cells. So it's very, very targeted uh, to particular sites and particular cells. So really, really powerful work, which I, th you know, I think will uh, bring great um, advances. In fact, I've known Sabine for some years. I was on her um, a PhD examination uh, panel when she did a PhD, brilliant PhD at EPFL in Lausanne uh, on swarm robotics. She then went to MIT and did a postdoc in, in uh, nanomedicine. So there's a beautiful example of, of moving between disciplines and then being able to create something new by combining those disciplines. My next example is, swarm, uh, is soft robotics. And I want to show you a, a, um, a piece of work that I'm, I particularly like. Could we have the sound on that, please? Yeah. So what you're seeing there is a rubber dome, this black rubber dome, and this is an artificial fingertip. Now, touch sensing, artificial touch sensing is really difficult, very difficult. You could have the sound there. Thank you. Um, and the brilliant student who invented this tack tip, we call it tack tip, basically what he did is he took a, a rubber dome and on the inside surface, the, the concave inner surface of the dome, he, he printed a matrix of white dots. And then he arranged a camera, this is a cross section, a camera which is looking up to the inside of the rubber dome. And you can see on that movie, I hope you can just about see, the pattern of white dots deforms as the fingertip moves across the surface. So what Callan did brilliantly is he converted a really hard problem, which is touch sensing, into an easy problem, a relatively easy problem of image processing. We know how to do image processing. So we're doing touch sensing by doing image processing. And this fingertip is perfectly capable of sensing shape and texture as well. Now, we've taken this a step further, thank you. Um, and can you see the, the bed of, of pins there? And the pins lift as the fingertip is, is, is touched. And what this is, this is what we call remote telehaptics. And basically it means that we now have the, the technology that a surgeon could feel what an artificial fingertip feels at the end of an instrument, the end of a laparoscopic instrument, for instance, with keyhole surgery. In fact, the surgeon doesn't even need to be in the same room or the same continent as the, as the instrument. Um, and we think this is really powerful. We, we've, we're developing this further in conjunction with, with the major hospitals in, in Bristol for uh, teleoperated surgery. Uh, and it's a beautiful example of, of soft robotics for sensing, and again, just to, to, to push the thing about 3D printing, why it's such a powerful technology for us, we not only print the, the major parts, like, like this yellow thing here, but we even 3D print the mold for the, the rubber uh, fingertip. Um, so the whole thing is fabricated in, in, in the lab. It's a, a lovely project, I hope you agree. And uh, what I can uh, show you here um, is that same technology now applied to keyhole surgery. This is the kind of, uh, of instrument. Um, this is obviously just a hand-operated um, instrument. It's rather crude. This is a, several years ago. Um, and what we're able to do is to provide force feedback uh, from the end of the instrument uh, back to the, 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 as it were, the human operator. Um, Again, I think this is really uh, powerful work. Um, and I, I should say that actually quite a lot of the work that I'm showing you just by accident is uh, in uh, medical and surgical robotics. And um, now this very important category of robots designed to work with humans. This is perhaps the most, um, you know, the strongest, if you like, the biggest defining quality of these second wave robots. Um, here, language, and if as well as sound, body thank you. Like this pointing. Okay, giving you lag.
Okay, what should I do? Help. Coming to help you. And then it can do what it's been asked to do. What should I do? Wait. Waiting. Grasp. Grasping. Waiting. Release. Waiting. What should I do? Thank you. Um, so that robot is called Bert, the Bristol Elumotion robot torso. Uh, and, and Bert basically was um, working with Corrine, the student there, and they were sharing the task of, of assembling flat pack furniture, basically. Um, so it's an example of what we call a workplace assistant robot, which we think is, is going to be really powerful, especially for flexible manufacture, where you want to change the thing that you're making perhaps you know, every day or, or, or even a couple of times a day. Um, and the important thing about that robot, uh, developed as part of the CRIS project, Cooperative Human Robot Interaction Systems, is that the robot understands both human speech, that's relatively easy, but more importantly, gesture. Because, I mean, you can see I do it all the time. Actually, most, of, most human communication is gestural, is body language. It's more important than speech. I mean, you'd think it very odd if I simply stood completely still and just spoke. Um, and we think that robots need to be able to understand human gesture, particularly if you go stop like that. Um, you know, it's really important. So this robot, in fact, understands and makes gestures as well, uh, Bert. And I also wanted to illustrate uh, just a, a picture there of, uh, of our... Um, we, we have basically a granny flat in the lab. It's a completely... Uh, it's a smart uh, apartment. It has, it has a living room, a, a bathroom, a kitchen, and so on, full, full scale. Um, and it's designed for us to, uh, uh, to test and develop new assisted living or care robots. Um, and it's led by my colleague, um, uh, Praminda Kaleb Soli, uh, wonderful facility, the Anchor uh, Robotics uh, Assisted Living Studio, um, full of, of the kind of robots that, I mean, here's an example of, of a robot that might, for instance, keep an eye on an elderly person, remind them when to take their medicine, or, um, or that, that they haven't had a drink of water for a couple of hours. Um, that kind of thing. So it's a combination of robot and a smart environment. So, for instance, the, you know, the, the packet of, 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 of pills, the medicine, will have a sensor on it. So will the fridge door. So will the tap. So the robot can, can read, essentially, uh, what's happening in, in the apartment and uh, respond uh, appropriately to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the elderly person. So, a uh, really great example of, of robots and humans working together. Now, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the President's um, uh, introduction, he mentioned driverless cars, um, and you also saw that in uh, the little uh, warm-up video there. Very important technology. We have a lot of work in driverless cars uh, in the lab. Here's a couple of examples, the Ventura project and the Flourish project. These are not really developing the technology they're really working on the human factors. Uh, we think the human factors are incredibly important. What kind? You know, how does a passenger react uh, to different different styles of driving of the of the car? I mean, if the car is very aggressive, then it's likely the passenger will be frightened or alarmed at, le at the very least. So we're very concerned with the human factors. Um, I have to say that I think driverless cars are going to take a lot longer to be in our lives than than. Uh, than certainly many people believe. Um, you've only got to ask yourself what you would do uh, if you come out of a, uh, of a side street onto a busy main road uh, when there's no gap. I mean, what, what, what do we do as human drivers? Well, we basically catch the eye of someone on the main road and hope that they'll, they'll let us out. You know, they'll indicate, you know, come on. Now, no driverless car can do that, not one. Uh, so it's often the, as it were, the, it's the difficult traffic, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the, the situations where we humans have evolved, as it were, unwritten human protocols to deal with those situations that are yet beyond um, the, uh, you know, the ability of driverless cars. Uh, it's a great technology, 
Um, I hope you know. I hope it's uh, uh, I hope it's around when I need it. You know, uh, in uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, and um, uh, but but I'm. I have to say I remain rather cautious about the uh, predictions of of when we will have driverless cars in everyday use. And uh, my final example, uh, uh, again, projects from the lab in med medical and surgical robotics. Uh, the, this thing on the left is an exo hand. It's a, it's a wearable robot, what we call a wearable robot. And this was an example of a robot that was designed, a hand that was designed for um, rehabilitation post-stroke. So the idea is that you wear this, this device, this exo hand, it senses when you're moving your fingers, and if you've had a stroke, you may, may well have lost function uh, or partial function of your hand. So it, it gives you extra force. So it, it, it kind of gives you a bit more strength in your hand. And then as you gradually regain the, uh, the use of, of that hand, it reduces the amount of power it applies until you don't need it anymore. So it's essentially a rehabilitation aid for uh, stroke victims. Uh, wearable robotics, I think, are really important. If, you know, if I had money, which I don't, that's the area I would invest in. I think wearables are going to be really important in the future, uh, really important. And the project on the right, which is the, the, the work of my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanya Dogramatsi, um, uh, this is work in building a robot uh, device or robot rig, if you like, for assisting in knee surgery. Now, knee surgery is, is particularly difficult, uh, um, uh, I'm told, in terms of, of lining up all the pieces of a, of a shattered knee uh, and, and pinning them together. In fact, this particular rig, uh, which you can see part of here, it's a big apparatus, and they, uh, they did field tests, I should say field tests, they did trials uh, on a human cadaver uh, about a year ago, uh, uh, down at one of the, the hospitals in Bristol. And uh, as part of, of the trial, and, and part of the th one of the things that you have to do if you're doing knee surgery is to pull apart the femur and the thigh to, to kind of, you know, open up, as it were, the, the, the space here. Of course, I'm not a medic, so I'm, uh, I don't really know what I'm talking about. But, but, but the, the thing that they discovered when they did this procedure on the cadaver is that the whole of the rig buckled because the forces are so great in, in the, the leg and the ligaments and so on. So they've had to take the, the rig back into the lab and re-engineer it to be much stronger than, than it was. But again, it's, uh, it's really great work. And my final um, segment uh, is on adaptive and, and learning uh, robots. And I want to show you another robot from uh, the CRIS project. And this is a, 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 an EU-funded, it's an open source uh, robot, so you can just download the plans and, and build this robot if you want. Uh, open source robot called iCub. And this robot is learning how to grasp this object, this red ball, uh, as it were, in the way that a child learns. Now, it's, it's a beautiful uh, demonstration, but it's also rather humbling because, you know, that demonstration took several person years of, of effort, uh, a team of European roboticists, whereas, of course, you know, uh, an infant child will learn how to do that with no, almost no effort from uh, her parents and will, at the same time, learn how to dress herself, how to you know, do many, many other things, how to speak and so on. Uh, so it just shows you how far we have to go in terms of robot learning. We have a, a lot of work to do to even approach the, the learning ability of a human infant. So, and I want to just finish uh, my little um, description of the robots of the lab with some work I've been doing recently on building ethical robots. So, let me just set the scene for you. I'm just looking at Akbar. How, how, how am I doing? Good five minutes? Good. So um, imagine that you're walking down the street and you see a hole in the pavement and somebody's about to fall into that hole in the pavement. Now, 
uh, it's likely that you'll, you'll try and save them, try and stop them from falling into the hole. Now, why is that? Well, it's not just because you're a good person. It's because you have the ability to predict the future. You can predict the consequences of this person who's peering at their smartphone you know, and not looking where they're going. You can also predict the likelihood of you actually being able to help. And that's exactly the experiment we set up here. So this is the A robot after Asimov. Here's a hole, not a real hole. The A robot is heading for this position here. And this is the H robot, the human robot, robot pretending to be a, a hapless human, not looking where it's going. And uh, this is um, an experiment uh, in simple ethical robots. And I'll show you what happens. So um, robot A, the Asimov robot, is in fact, um, it has inside it a simulation of itself and the other robot. So it's continuously predicting the future. It's telling the future. It's, it's predicting the consequences of its actions. And you can see that the robot, in fact, the A robot, has successfully just collided with the H robot. It's gone off safely, uh, and it works. You can see that the A robot notices the H robot and, and heads it off, and it works perfectly. And at the end of this experiment, I said to Christian, uh, who, who the, the PhD student who did the work, I said, this is a bit boring. We can't really write a paper where we just say, well, it works. Uh, so I said to him, why don't we put two H robots in and give the robot, give the ethical robot a dilemma? And we believe this is the world's first example of a robot facing a, an ethical dilemma. Um, and I should say it's running exactly the same code as before. We haven't changed the code one bit. So same setup, except there are two H robots, both not looking where they're going. And the A robot, um, ah, OK, fails to save either of them. And, um, and you know what? It took us a while to figure out why the A ro robot is so bad. Um, in fact, it's consistently bad. Occasionally, it saves one of them, turns around, but it's too late for the other one, and so on. Um, and it took us a while to figure out what's going on here. The problem is that we've given the A robot the ability to recalculate the consequences of its actions two times a second. So every half a second, it can change its mind. It doesn't have a mind, of course, but it, it can change its decision. So we've not only made an ethical robot, we've also made a pathologically indecisive robot, <laughs> which is not a good idea, of course. And um, when um, another colleague, Dieter van der Elst, set up the same experiment with these humanoid robots, the same thing happened. So it wasn't just because of that particular experiment. <laughs> Sorry, mate, you know, you're going to plunge to your doom. I'll go and save that guy instead. So, um, and I, I think I'm very short of time now, but I'm just going to very quickly um, uh, show you a picture of, of some of our um, wonderful uh, incubator. We have an incubator in the lab. Uh, Akbar saw this when he came to visit the lab a few weeks ago. And so far, we've spun out around a dozen companies um, and uh, we, we we're very proud of, of, in particular, one of them, Open Bionics. Well, we're proud of all of them, but Open Bionics is particularly interesting. They make 3D printed prosthetic hands and arms for primarily children, young people who've lost a hand or an arm for whatever reason. They've done a deal with Disney and with uh, Deus Ex, the, the games company, so that these arms and hands are kind of styled after superhero arms and hands. In other words, nothing like kind of awful hospital prosthetics. So they've made them really cool, you know, cool for kids. A great company. I can, I can, I, you know, you should, you should check them out. They've won tons of awards recently. Um, and just a, a few words on ethics. I know I'm almost out of time. Uh, Akbar's uh, um, nodding at me, yes. Um, so I've, uh, this is a, a picture which I thought you might be interested in that I, I uh, uh, composed for evidence to the uh, 2016 Parliamentary Select Committee uh, on the Commons Select Committee on Science and Technology, uh, showing the link from ethics to standards and to regulation. And I think that regulation is part of building trust. Uh, because when you have transparent regulation, in other words, there's public engagement going on at the same time as regulation, 
then people understand that the technology, you, the, the aircraft that you're flying on is well regulated, is well, you know, it's well built, it's built to very tough standards. If there's an accident, you know that it will be investigated to very, very rigorous standards of investigation. So um, ethic, ethics is a kind of trust technology. I think that we need ethics so that we trust our technology. And um, in the last couple of years, I've been involved uh, in the British Standards Institute. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, BS 8611 uh, is the world's first uh, ethical standard for the design of robots and robotic systems. In fact, BS 8611 is a kind of methodology, a toolkit for allowing engineers, roboticists, to conduct what we call an ethical risk assessment of their robot or their robotic system to help them to mitigate the ethical risks. Uh, we, inside the, the standard, uh, we've set out, uh, we've brainstormed, if you like, a whole range of ethical risks, uh, everything from addiction, vulnerability, um, uh, uh, jo uh, job employment uh, uh, harms, um, all the way through to environmental harms, sustainability. So a, a huge range of, of ethical hazards uh, and, and uh, advice on how to mitigate those hazards. And more recently, I've become involved in the IEEE um, Standards Association. IEEE is a, a very big um, uh, electrical engineering institution, electrical and electronic engineering uh, institution um, led from the US um, members right across the world. But their Standards Association is extremely um, uh, uh, successful. You've all heard of Wi-Fi. Well, Wi-Fi is an IEEE standard. It's IEEE 802.11, in fact for the geeks among you. Um, and uh, early in 2016, the IEEE Standards Association launched this global ethics initiative in robotics and AI. Uh, it covers the whole of computational intelligence, everything from you know, um, a medical diagnosis AI to a driverless car and everything in between. Um, and in that, um, in that work, we are developing uh, uh, both tools for to help um, Designers design ethically. It's what we call ethically aligned design. In fact, there's a document which you can download called ethically aligned design. We're also developing new standards, and I'm leading a standard uh, as part of this work called P7001, which is a new standard on transparency in autonomous systems. The basic idea behind that is that it should always be possible to find out why a robot or an AI made a particular decision. Now, that's very easy to say, but hard to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the end of the lecture. Um, thank you so much for listening, and, um, and I just, of course, want to acknowledge my, uh, my colleagues in the lab. So, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, uh, for a really, really remarkably interesting uh, talk. Um, you, you touched on a lot of the, the history of robotics and, and how much you've contributed to that, to that history, and, and no doubt to the future that uh, we're going to have to face at some stage. Um, but you also just touched on ethics, and, and what I wanted to do was to open up the discussion a little bit more and talk maybe a bit about the economic implications, sure. maybe some of the social implications, and, and, and also, you know, the, these topics, sort of elements of, of robotics. Um, but, but to kick off with, with the economics, so um, we, we, we hear sort of every day something about the impact that AI is going to have. Sure. Um, some, some of these, these forecasts suggest in the next two years, the industry is going to grow about a hundredfold in <coughs> these two years. In, in about 12 years, by 2030, mm -hmm. we're going to see um, about 15% of our GNP represented yeah. through uh, artificial intelligence. Um, just mind-boggling figures. Uh, it, you know, there was a recent report that suggested that China's um, uh, economy in the next 12 years will be about 24% uh, driven through, through uh, artificial intelligence. So, so really, really quite interesting yeah. figures. Uh, the UK, the suggestion is 30% of our GNP yeah. will be tied to. Um, yeah. So that's a positive side, economic value creation. Sure. And then, of course, a knee-jerk reaction is, what does that mean for me? <laughs> and, and so you look at other surveys, and they suggest um, a 
total restructuring of, of, of the basis on which we create value, and that means basically the workplace. Yes, um, yes. Some, some suggestions are that we're going to have to see about a billion jobs in the economy, global economy, being restructured. Um, so my question to you is, uh, this is, this is going to happen almost tomorrow. Uh, we need to prepare now for it. Uh, what are some of the educational sort of elements that we should be looking at now? What are some of the training skills that we might want to sort of invest in uh, in order to, to tackle that future, that era of artificial intelligence? Sure. Well, you know, I would say uh, I, there are several things to say, I think, uh, Alno, to, to that question. Um, the first is I don't think things will happen as quickly as the prediction suggests. Right. Right. And um, the, the, the famous roboticist I showed, Rodney Brooks uh, at MIT, um, on, on one of the early slides, um, he, he said, look, he said, the problem is that, that a lot of predictions are being made about, you know, all, um, uh, you know, uh, workers in, in, in hotels, for instance, right. um, catering workers or, or people who, who change the room will be replaced by such and such a date. Now, what you have to do is, he said, Rodney said, you have to ask yourself how many of those robots are do, doing that job right now, today? And the answer generally is zero. So if, there's, if there isn't a single, even a single prototype of a job being done by a, a, a robot, a prototype of a robot doing that job, then really these predictions are fantasy. Now, I'm not saying that they're completely out of, out of the question. Uh, I think the biggest risks are to um, knowledge work. Um, in other words, AI, soft AI, uh, as opposed to robots, hard AI, um, that's moving faster. Uh, the truth is that it's, it's easier to, to make an impact with soft AI than with, with real physical robots. Real physical robots are hard. They're hard to make work. I mean, there isn't a robot on the planet that could make you a cup of tea in your kitchen right now. Sure. You know, that's how difficult real robots, you know, real world robots are. But as for what we need to do, yes, we need to be prepared. Um, I mean, I would say to everyone in the room, you know, you need to persuade your children, your nephews, your nieces, um, you know, boys and girls, especially girls, learn coding. Coding is a really key skill. You know, I think it's fundamental. Uh, kids should be taught to code, I would say, more or less from the age that they're starting to read and write. I mean, it, really young. And I think that's that's in a sense, the, 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 the key skill uh, to be, as it were, a winner in this new jobs economy. Now, of course, coding isn't enough. You, you, know, you, you need to do you know, maths and, and, and humanities. I think it's really important that, uh, and we're beginning to understand in, in robotics and AI, that actually ethical AI and ethical robotics, robotics needs um, a cross-disciplinary approach. You know, the, it, it, if it's just engineers, then we're, we're, we're really, you know, in a mess. You know, it shouldn't just be down to engineers. I nearly said a rude word there. Um, so, it, you know, we need, we need a, 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 an approach that, that involves the humanities just as much as, as the sciences. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, let, let, me, let me then tackle that issue. Um, you know, it used to be that, that you know, we were comfortable about the future at one stage, and now we're not sort of so comfortable. Um, uh, great, yeah. uh, so so one, one of the issues is, um, you know, if, if people misbehaved, if there were things that were essentially needing some regulation to reflect <clears throat> social values and mores and so on, then, then you know, the legal framework would kind of kick into place yeah. and, and yeah. you'd get people to be disciplined according to sort of social expectations. Um, with, with robots and with AI, um, it becomes much, much more difficult because, you know, if you, if you suggest that, you know, those who know coding, um, uh, those who can basically compile alg algorithms, um, they're going to be the, you know, 20, maybe 30-year-olds, they're going to be maybe from Western society, they'll be trained at MIT and maybe at Bristol and elsewhere, um, and, and in a sense their ethics get grounded yes. in, into the activities that you want AI to sort of perform and service. Um, and, and I wonder how you might 
sort of suggest that we, we need to operationalize a system whereby you know a wider set of ethics get represented into AI so, so that we're covering the whole of sort of society yeah. because it's supposed to be serving the whole of society. Absolutely agree with you. In fact, I, I didn't mention um, with the IEEE initiative, yeah. the primary ambition of that initiative is educational. Essentially, it's a long-term ambition to, to, to train the entire next generation of, of, of computer scientists, uh, engineers, um, AI technologists in ethics, right. in ethically aligned design. You know, the ambition is to make sure that, in, that, that from the near future onwards, ethics are baked in from the very beginning right. of the design process. Right. Ethics shouldn't be like quality. You, you know, we used to think of quality in the, um, the, the late 60s as something you could add on. You, know, you, could, you could add quality at the end of the process. We realized that was wrong. You can't do that. Quality has to be sure. embedded. The same is true of ethics. Now, to come to your, your, your other point, you're absolutely right that you know, there is something deeply wrong when uh, most of our AI um, frankly, is being designed by a very small subset of the population, basically young white men, often West Coast, you know, uh, white men. Um, and the problem is that, that it's their values that are being built in, even if they don't realize it, uh, they probably don't. Um, you know, the, the Silicon Valley ethos of, of move fast and break things is absolutely not what we should be doing. That is irresponsible innovation, irresponsible innovation. It's unethical to move fast and break things. And I think it's vitally important that the teams, the design teams that build our technology should reflect the, the whole of society. In other words, you know, 50-50 gender balance and full representation of, of, of all of society, you know, the, the ethnic minorities as well as the you know, the majorities. I think that's really important in order that those values then are reflected in the products sure. uh, and processes sure. that they're developing. Sure, sure, sure. sure. That, that, that's difficult to disagree with. On the other hand, very, very, very difficult to operationalize. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, with, with Brexit, you know, you might suggest that, uh, you know, a lot of individuals really had no idea what they were doing when they were voting, and now they'd rather change their mind. But this is much, much more complex in yeah. a sense. Yeah. So, so the question arises, you know, if but you, it, if you it ask. Really? Is it really? I mean, in, in my lab, we've, right. we've changed the proportion of women from zero right. to about 40% right. over 15 years. Right. Now, you know, and, and pe people say to me, how have you achieved that? And the answer is very simple. We've hired senior women. If you hire senior women, junior sure. women follow. Sure, sure, sure. So it's that, not that difficult. No, no, but, but, but you know, I suspect that, you know, you look at Germany and you find that they're very, very cautious indeed about any AI enterprise. Sure. You look at the US and as you say, you know, it's sort of, you know, let, let's fail fast if we're going to fail so that we can move on to the next thing. Um, but the truth is that in technology, the leaders are the ones who essentially <laughs> colonize the world technologically. Yeah. And, and so, so in a sense, you know, you, you run the very real risk of having certain groups of individuals, as you say, typically Western, male, maybe sort of liberal-minded, who, who um, ground and, and, and bake the ethics. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so that there, there is that sense in which, you know, uh, economies such as the US, which are advancing very quickly, have less sort of protection around the impact of, 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 of technology and therefore ethics. Um, in the UK, we might sort of, you know, put the bar a little bit higher, and the Germans sort of higher than that. Sure. But but um, technology is universal, and and so to me, that's that's the complexity. How do you ground or how do you bake, to, to use your language, ethics that are generic, in into technology that's going to be fairly universal? Mm. It, it, I, you, you're right. It's Alnor. It is a it's a, a huge task, and and it's it's actually a. a, a a generational task. I mean, we're not going to achieve this in five years or ten years, but <clears throat> but but I think you know there there are things we can do. We can we can shame companies. Right. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm I'm currently uh, working on a little project on my blog right. where I'm I'm trying to ask through Twitter who's doing ethical governance, which robotics and AI companies are doing ethical governance. Sure. You know what? I'm getting a deafening silence. You know. Right. Um, I don't think very many are. Sure. Um, yet, it's odd because actually being 
visibly, transparently ethical, surely is, will give you an edge. I mean, many of us, I'm sure in this room, are ethical consumers. Sure. I, I'd far more rather buy my robot from an ethical supplier than sure. an unethical supplier. Sure. Sure. But, um, you know, the, uh, I've, I've kind of lost my thread. No, th that's right. The, you know, another important thing that, that I think people tend to forget is that there's lots of, of tons of existing law that applies to, you know, so, uh, you know, take an AI uh, like Facebook, it still, you know, must not contravene basic human rights. Sure. Sure. So, uh, again, it's, it's it, you know, I've seen this in my students. Um, it's amazing how many robotics students think that somehow what they're doing is outside legal frameworks. Sure. It's not, of course. Sure. We already have lots of product law, uh, you know, human rights, privacy, uh, you know, freedoms and so on, which of course apply to every single piece of robotics and AI that we sure, design. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah no, fascinating. Well, let, let me turn that now to something else. Um, you're you're an optimist. It strikes me. Uh, yes, I, mean, I you, am. You wouldn't fundamentally. Be in, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I'm, I'm also a professional worrier. Of course. Yes, yeah. So, so, so absolutely. But n now, you know, you 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 have. Um, very significant figures, you know, from, from Bill Gates to Elon Musk to Putin, yep. Um, yep. you know, to, to, to Stephen Hawking. You know, who would say, um, I mean, Stephen Hawking, I, I think, at, at very recently said AI is really the end of humanity. Yep. Um, uh, Bill Gates is very worried about super intelligence. He thinks it's around the corner. Um, there is this sense in which, uh, you know, if you have artificial intelligence, and artificiality is really about, you know, the, 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 the human element that you're basically grounding into machines. But is there a stage in your mind where we're not going to have artificial intelligence out of artificial intelligence? It'll just be intelligence, and it'll be intelligence that supersedes ours. You know, um, I, I, I think some people would refer to that as singularity. Is, is there a stage in your mind that we're going to hate at some point in time where essentially we're not going to be the most intelligent beings on Earth? Well, Curiously, and people say to me, you know, when will we have super intelligence? My answer is actually we have it already. Right. Uh, so we already, we've had, we've had chess programs that are better than the, the best chess players for several decades. Uh, you know, we've, we've, for, since 2016, we've had Go players, AI Go playing AI, better than the world's sure. best Go players. Sure. You know, we already have driverless cars that are as good as some drivers, um, you know, <laughs> But getting better. So, so. Um, but the the important thing there is that all of those examples are what we call narrow AI. In other words, they're they're super intelligent in one thing only. You know, you can't ask a chess program to make you a cup of tea, or you can't have a conversation about about uh, Aristotle with a chess program. Um, the what the the kind of holy grail of, of AI, if you like, is human equivalent. Um, artificial intelligence, or it's sometimes called artificial general intelligence. Right. Now, it's it's. I think it's it's far f further into the future than than we expect. I certainly don't agree with my colleagues who say, well, 50 years. I mean, actually, it's easy to say 50 years because, of course, you won't be around to to be held <laughs> held to that prediction. Um, but the, the, and, and here's the problem. In fact, I'm, I'm now working with the, the Center for the Future of Intelligence in Cambridge. I've just become a fellow there. And one of the things that we, 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 not, we need to understand is that we don't actually know what intelligence is. So how can we build artificial intelligence if we don't know what natural intelligence is? You know, we have no definition of intelligence uh, that encompasses all creatures on the planet. You know, we, we have the IQ test for humans, but that, we know that's a very poor uh, measure of intelligence. So, curiously, and I'm going to be very critical now of, of my field, curiously, uh, AI is a kind of science-free endeavor. In other words, we don't have a theoretical model of intelligence that, that AI it then builds upon. It's, it's a bit like trying to do particle physics with no standard model. Sure. Um, sure. So I think it's going to take much, much longer right. than, than the, you know, the, and, and you know, what I would say to, uh, to Stephen Musk very respectfully is, is well, you know, um, I'm not going to make any big claims about cosmology. Right, you know. sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you don't think in my lifetime I'm going to be interviewing a professor of human ethics who happens to be a robot? No, I don't think you are, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, so All right. attractive as that, that prospect might <laughs> yeah. seem. And, and, you know, I would say that, you know, there's this robot called uh, Sophia, the Hanson Robotics yes. robot. Um, it's really a stunt. I mean, it, it's... Right. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, I, you know, I, I like the work of, of Hanson Robotics. We have several of our robot, their robots in our lab. But the idea of, of giving this robot citizenship um, is, is completely absurd, you know. Uh, completely, I really could use a rude word. In fact. Um, uh, and and uh, unfortunately, it, it distracts from the truth. You know, it's basically a chat bot. It's it's a conversational AI with a physical sure. body, not even a physical body, a physical sure. head. Sure. Um, and uh, I'm afraid it's dangerous. Yeah. It, it okay. really gives the wrong impression of sure. where we are in okay. robotics. Okay. Okay. Let me let me open up uh, maybe to to um, the audience uh, if if there are any questions. Um, I think we've got a lady there. I think there's, there's a roving mic coming. So, um, <coughs> uh, you, no, this one. Uh, yeah. Here, there's a lady at the front. Yes. Hello. First of all, thank you for the wonderful lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, personally, just to give you a background, I have uh, got a master's in intelligence systems, and I'm currently working on deep learning and so on. Oh, Just I hope I haven't offended you then. <laughs> no, but I had a question for you with that regard. You mentioned that, you know, uh, figuring out how um, the decision has been made, that becomes difficult with robots, especially with deep learning and with Go, as you know. Hmm. Uh, it came up with a strategy that no human had ever came up with. That's right, the so-called uh, yes. Move 37 in, yes. in the final game, yes, yes, that's right. And with Jeff Hinton's discovery around deep learning and yeah. so on, we know that it's really becoming difficult in prototype examples to yes. Yes. be able to actually pinpoint <coughs> how the robot made a decision right. yes. in those examples. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think uh, the governance would be brought in to really put ethics into those kind of test prototypes which are already in live and going sure. into production? No, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say, of course, is that those are not safety critical systems. So if it's playing a game of Go, it doesn't matter if we don't understand why it made a particular move. Um, but I would say that we should simply not be, we must not use um, deep learning systems in safety critical uh, applications. They are being used in medical and life sciences, healthcare situations well, already. So. Well, I would say that's dangerous. Yes. Um, and, you know, if an AI, if a medical diagnosis AI is recommending a diagnosis, then that's not quite as bad as if it's making a diagnosis. Yes. You know, in other words, if there's a, a clinician who then listens to that recommendation and thinks, no, that doesn't make sense, yes. I'm not going to go with that. But, but, you know, my challenge to the deep learning community is very simple. Look, you're smart men and women. Invent a deep learning system that is explainable, that is interpretable. I simply don't believe it's not possible. But I take a very hard view. If, if, if it is impossible to figure out why a deep learning system made a particular decision, then we absolutely must not be using it in safety critical systems. And that's why my question was, you know, is there any kind of governance which kind of brings into that ethical aspect of um, in these kind of projects? Well, at, at, the, at present, at no. At the moment, no. At present, yeah. no. But I think this is why we need regulation. You know, I would say, um, you know, uh, driverless cars, for instance, that are not transparent should be illegal. Where the autopilot is, is opaque, where it's inscrutable, they should be illegal. And I've said this to, you know, to several parliamentary uh, committees. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a, a question here in the front, the gentleman at the top. Yeah. <clears throat> the extreme ramification of the automation, some futurists think that in about 30 or 40 years, 57% of the world population will be unemployed. Yeah. 
uh, they also reckon, you see, there is a view that if William Beveridge was alive today, he would have recommended, you see, universal basic income. Yes. This is one of the great ethics or issue of our time. What's yes. your view on that? Uh, well, I absolutely agree with you, 100% agree with you. I, think, I mean, for me, the two biggest ethical problems in, in robotics and AI are gender, which I've, I've mentioned already, and wealth inequality. Uh, the problem is, you know, we need, we, we, the, we see this already, you know, enormous amounts of wealth are being created by the big AI companies, vast, I mean, you know, uh, wealth that's unimaginable. And, and for me, you know, it's really important that the wealth generated by robotics and AI should be shared by all in society. And, and, you know, I'm not just saying that because I'm jealous of the, of the wealth that, that those companies have created. I am, of course, but, 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 but what we need to understand is that we all funded that research. So, you know, all of the, the research that is being exploited by these mega companies was, to start with, publicly funded. It was, it was, it was funded through the taxpayer in universities uh, and possibly in military establishments, but still uh, taxpayer funded. So actually, you know, we should uh, enjoy a premium. And, and I think that the, the simple truth is that, that uh, you know, a, a future in which almost everybody is unemployed uh, is unsustainable. I mean, clearly, um, you know, the whole of society will break down. Uh, so it's in nobody's interests for that kind of wealth inequality to, uh, to uh, sustain, to continue and grow. Okay, thank you. Um, we have um, a question, but a couple of hands up here. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Winfield, for such a fascinating lecture. Uh, my thank question you. comes out of my personal um, studies. I'm doing a master's in bioethics at the moment at King's College. Um, Great. And something that we were discussing in class recently was um, the naturalist fallacy. Um, and I was wondering how it plays into emerging technologies because using the terms artificial versus natural, um, it leads to sort of a framing effect uh, within the public. And um, I was wondering what your opinion is on the implications of this framing effect for emerging technologies and uh, public trust regarding these technologies. Thank you. I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you mean by the framing effect? So Sorry. calling something artificial versus calling something um, natural or yeah. natural intelligence that has um, a psychological effect on the public yes. determining whether or not these technologies are something that they would like to buy into or yeah. not. So yeah. Yeah. is it going to be problematic later on when you're trying to um, gather funding or gather public support for these emerging technologies when you're calling them artificial yeah. versus natural? Um, yes, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I really know the answer. Um, well, I don't know the answer to any really quite really uh, the answer to any of these questions but but um, it's certainly true that um, the inventor of the term artificial intelligence um, uh, McCarthy John McCarthy uh, uh, regretted inventing that term because it, it set up if you like it, it framed um, uh, a false expectation you know by calling something AI uh, we then <coughs> Because humans anthropomorphize, we're, we're pathological anthropomorphizers, then we tend to imbue things that aren't very smart with much more smart smartness, and especially if they're called AI. We tend to assume an AI is, is really smart, whereas it, it generally isn't very smart at all. Um, and you're right that, that somehow natural um, intelligence or natural uh, implies good, um, and artificial, I, I, you know, I'm not sure if it implies good or, or, or bad. Uh, it depends on who you are. It depends on whether you're a, a techno-optimist or, or a pessimist. But, um, but I agree with you that it is a problem. I'm going to have to think about that one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for certainly one more. Yeah. So a quick, quick one, if, if uh, we can have the mic. Over here. So uh, you were talking about how we need to have more cultural representation within the design of AI. Yeah. So how do you think we can appropriate um, user interaction 
uh, to resonate with uh, diverse mindsets of people. And leading on for that, from that, how do you think we could train an AI to be able to think in a cultural mindset, if we could, that was a lot broader and not uh, focused on one context? Gosh, that's a, a tough question. I mean, the first one of those, um, I'd refer you to frameworks of, of responsible research and innovation. So one of them is called the AREA framework, which means stands for anticipate, reflect, engage, and act. And, and an, uh, anticipation, reflection, engaging, really it means that if you're designing a product, you need to engage deeply with your customer, with your, with your user base, and listen, really listen, really reflect on what they're saying. And that, that user base hopefully you know, reflects the diversity of the society that you're hoping to serve or, or, or you know, is your customer base. Um, and by engaging in responsible research and innovation, you can properly uh, build that feedback into your product. Now, the second part of that is more difficult because, you know, bias in, in AI is now well known. Um, uh, you know, uh, terrible examples of, of uh, vision image processing AIs that, that will only uh, properly recognize, you know, white faces. Um, and, and that's, I'm sorry, but that's just bad engineering. I mean, the problem with a lot of these deep learning systems is that they've taken uncurated data from the internet, just, you know, let's take a, a million images from Facebook, completely uncurated, and use that data to train the, the AI. Well, that's just bad engineering. So good engineering means not only transparent algorithms, but actually curated data uh, that's used to, to train the, the system. Okay, thank you. I think uh, good timekeeping means that I have to stop here. Uh, th thank you for those questions, and uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for a thought-provoking and highly informative discussion. Our sincere thanks to you, Professor Allen, for an excellent keynote address, <coughs> and to you, Professor Alnur, for facilitating a stimulating discussion. I'd like to thank also Barclays Eagles Labs uh, for being here tonight. So after that, do you still take the pessimistic view that when machines do everything, there will be no work left? Indeed, machines are cheaper, faster, smarter. They don't fall sick, nor take vacation. For some, the future of work looks bleak. Humans need not apply. These are genuine worries. But then there is the optimistic view that work has always changed. Remember telegraphists and switchboard operators? New technology allowed people to move away from dull jobs into more fulfilling ones. Machines, in the end, are tools that need to be used by people. The work goes on forever. Wash, rinse, repeat. <laughs> My takeaway from Professor Allen's address is that AI and robotics could enable an advancement of society to benefit all. Professor Allen, you referred to the bigger danger coming from artificial stupidity. Worries about robots taking over come from images of the Terminator. It is highly unlikely. Rather, we do need to worry about jobs, about weaponization of AI, about standards in driverless cars, in care robots, in medical diagnosis AI. Technology in isolation does not shape the future. Other societal challenges of an aging population, of social inequality, of joblessness also impact. So all stakeholders will need to ensure that the transition is smooth, that AI technology is implemented ethically, justly, around a set of standards, that it enriches lives, and that the fruits are widely shared across all levels of society. For advances in medicine, education, economic activity, infrastructure, there is opportunity. As for work, it transforms. Some old jobs disappear, but new ones, jobs of the future, emerge, and they are augmented by AI. We will need to revamp education, making lifelong learning systems ever more important. 
After all, we'll need those engineers for 3D printing. Teachers of English as a foreign language for robots. That's true. Drone programmers. <clears throat> oh, and therapists for Snapchat addiction. Yeah. Can I now please request President Banu Nazira Hashim and Vice President Banu Shazma Mawani to come forward to present a token of our appreciation to Alan and Al Noor. And please join me in giving them another round of applause. Each of the hosts you have engaged with this evening are volunteers. They are exemplars of our shared community values. Our heartfelt thanks go to all the volunteers involved in this evening's arrangements.